Please take your Bible and join me with First John, First John chapter one. First John chapter one. I'll try to be short this morning. Appreciate the Heartland group here, the fine singing, and your attention. Amen. Today, this morning, I want to talk about having an abundant life in Jesus Christ. In this chapter here, 1 John chapter 1, we're going to talk about some key words where it talks about fellowship, fellowship with the Lord, the joy of the Lord. So I know you've been sitting a while. Let's all stand as we read a couple verses from 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it. And we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest unto us. Now notice what he says in verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you. Why is he writing these things? That your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for your word. As we open our hearts to your word, I pray that you'll help us, Lord, to grow closer to Jesus Christ. Help us to have joy in this world today where we're, we focus on you. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. <clears throat> people in the world today, you may be seated, people in the world want to be happy. We understand that. But if you think about what happiness is, happiness is content, contingent on events or things that take place in our life. During a lady's life, she's very happy on the day she gets married. But years later, that happiness, that joy, may, or that happiness may not be there. You see, happiness is contingent on happenings, things that take place. But joy, you can have joy no matter what. Things may be going wrong and you can still have joy within your heart. It's not contingent on things that takes place. It's contingent on what takes place in your heart. And that comes from Jesus Christ. Here we see John. He wants you and I to have the joy of the Lord. He wants us to say, have the same fellowship that he has. Now I want you to notice something very interesting. How he starts this passage uh, with us. Look again with me at verse 1. He says, that which was from the beginning. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the, we beheld his, uh, his glory. He's talking about Jesus Christ when he became flesh. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, this is a personal thing, which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon, our hands have handled the Word of life. Verse 2, and the life was manifest that we have seen it and we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life. He's saying, now listen, folks. Now, I'm not speaking from something that I've heard from somebody else. This is firsthand experience. These are men that walked with Jesus Christ. These are men that had fellowship with Jesus Christ. These are men that spent time with Jesus. They saw the miracles. They listened to the parables. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were instructed by Jesus themselves. These people have firsthand knowledge. I've not walked beside Jesus Christ. All I've seen is, heard, is read the word of God. Now, he's telling you and I that we can have the same fellowship with God and with Jesus Christ as he has. And I'm thinking, how can that happen? Well, see, he's going to give us some of those keys in this word. Notice verse 3 again. <clears throat> he said, that which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, notice this, that ye also, that you and I also may have fellowship with us, and truly, our fellowship is with who? The Father. That's God. God the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. He wants you and I to have the same fellowship with God that He has. He wants you and I to have the same fellowship with Jesus Christ that He has. But there's a problem. We all have the same problem. That problem is sin. Now, first of all, to have the, this fellowship, you have to... Uh, you have to come to Jesus Christ. You have to be born into his family. You have to have this spiritual birth. That's the first thing that you need. If you're not saved, then you can't have this fellowship unless you accept Christ as your Savior. So he's telling us that we can have this same thing even if you're in Christ. Then he says, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. There's a lot of people in this world, they do not experience the joy of the Lord. 
They, they live tough lives. They live hard lives. They live lives where they're, uh, they're living in darkness. They're living in sin. And a lot, of it, a lot of the time, it's because of the choices they make. You know, and he says, you don't have to be that way. You can have the fullness of the Lord, the fullness of joy. You can walk with that same fellowship. Do you realize when these men walked with Jesus Christ, they never went without? They never lacked. We can go back through the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We can read uh, the stories that took place when, when Jesus saw the multitudes. He had compassion on them. And he says, hey, listen, how much food do we have? I want you to feed them. They said, Lord, we can't feed them. All we have here is a lad here. He's got five loaves of bread and, and a couple of fish. But what is that among so many? He says, feed them. It's enough. And he started breaking. And he fed 5,000 men with that little sack lunch from a boy. So they never went without. He sends him across the sea there and uh, uh, while he's praying. And then finally he comes out and he meets them. He's walking on the water. He's walking next. They saw things. You know, and he's saying that you and I can have the same fellowship with the Lord. So that's exciting. Verse five says, then this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Why does he say that? Because we are all sinners. We all have the same problem, but we need to understand something about Jesus. Something that we need to understand about God is that there's no sin in him whatsoever. Now let me, one of the things that I, I'm heavy on that I preach on, I preach against sin. I'm going to call uh, homosexuality sodomy. It's wrong. It's an abomination against God. Lying is a sin. I preach on separation. A person who calls himself a Christian and then, but looks like the world and acts like the world and dresses like the world, that's not a person that's having fellowship with God. That's a person who calls himself a Christian and walks in darkness. Let me prove to you the next verse. Remember, in God there is no darkness at all. That means there is no sin, no hint of sin in his life. Verse 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You see what he's saying here? You can say all you want that I have fellowship with him. But if you look like a duck, you walk like a duck, and you act like a duck, you're a duck. You got it? If you look like the world, and you act like the world, and you dress like the world, you're in the world, you're in darkness. You're a liar, and the truth is not in you. You see, he called me out of darkness. When I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, I, I, I did some things in my life. I got my hair cut. I changed the way I dressed. I changed the way I spoke. My language changed. I, ch I changed the way I treated my family and my wife. I didn't walk in darkness anymore. Now, through time, I continued to grow in the Lord. And that's part of the Christian walk. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it talks about where, where uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I wanted the new. I changed my life. I hear all the time as a pastor, people say, well, you don't need to go to church in order to go to heaven. That's true, you don't. All you need is Jesus Christ. But if you're truly a born-again Christian, you will go to church. You know why? So you can learn more about your Father in heaven. So you can learn more about all the goodness and the greatness that He has in store for you and the blessings. You see, as a child of God, He didn't save me to leave me where I was at in the world. He didn't leave me to... Uh, uh, save me to leave me in that, that slump that I was in, to leave me in the poverty of sin that I was in. He says, you're mine now. Walk with me. And as I walk with the Lord, you know what he's doing? He's teaching me. He's training me. He's giving me principles and precepts to, to grow by. Stuff that makes me a better person. Not a holier than now that like people try to, to say that we act. That's not it. But he wants us to be more like him, a person of integrity, a person with character. Here's something I want you folks to think with me for just a second. You see these young ladies as they stood up here. The first thought that ought to come out of your mind is those are ladies. How could you tell they're ladies, not just girls or women, but ladies because of their hair, because of the way they dress, because of the way they act. Those are Christian godly young ladies amen 
And when God calls a woman into salvation and out of darkness, he cleans them up and he makes them young ladies. He makes guys gentlemen. He makes a, a man who's a husband and a father, he makes him a better husband and a better father. He makes him a godly man. He changes us. If you look like and act like the way you are when you got saved, then something's wrong with your salvation. And I don't want that kind of salvation. I don't want nothing to do with it because it didn't work for you. It won't work, work for me. Ain't that right? Ain't I know. That's good. All right. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, it's tough words. We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus uh, Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Well, preacher, how can I have this abundant life? How can I have fellowship when I sin? Easy. He gives you another clue. Look down at verse 9. One of the things that we need to add uh, to our life. Here it is. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? To cleanse us, I'm sorry, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There you go. When I was saved, I didn't stop sinning, but the sin habits were broken. The chains were tore off of me. He released me from sin's bondage. And because, but I've got that old nature, but now I've got a new nature, and I need to know how to uh, learn how to use it. So as I'm growing, I keep falling down, and he says, here, let me help you back up. Now, don't do that again. Let me teach you how to avoid that. All right. Hey, I'm sorry I did. That's all right. Let's keep moving on. I'm having fellowship with him. He's teaching me some things. And so I'm keeping a clean record. Lord, I'm sorry. Help me. Let me say this now. As a Christian, there's some people I cannot have fellowship with. I will not have fellowship with people who are drinking. I won't do it. I'll not have fellowship with sodomites. I'll not do it. I'll be nice to them. I'll witness to them. I'll share the gospel with them. I'll try to get them to saved. If they get saved, they'll stop being sodomites. I'll not fel fellowship with people who curse all the time. But let me, let me say this now, or people lose their temper. Let me say this. A Christian who loses a temper, a Christian that curses, and says, oh man, I'm sorry. I can have fellowship with them. Why? Because they're trying to be godly if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's given you and me a key. I'm a sinner, but I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. There's none righteous, no, not one. We all need Jesus Christ. And so, but God is faithful to forgive us. God is faithful to clean us up and, and to wash it all away. He can do that. And so you keep short accounts with God. You keep confessing your sins. We've got another uh, privilege here. Go to chapter 2. In chapter 2, he gives us another key on how we can have this fellowship, how we can have this abundant life and this joy. He's saying, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. I don't know how I can go through life without sinning. Am I supposed to be sinless and perfect? No, we are an imperfect people. We are sinful people, and we will sin every day. Some people's sins are out there in the open for all to hear and see, and some people's sins are right here in the mind and in the heart. Jesus dealt with that in Matthew chapter 5. He says, man, you say it's wrong to commit adultery, and it is. But I say unto you, if you look after a woman and lust after her in her heart, you've already committed adultery with her. Same difference, still sin. You know, and we're all sinners. But then he goes on, that you sin not. And if any man sin, notice this, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Why is that important? Because Jesus died for our sins. He paid for them in full on the cross of Calvary. He paid for every single one of them. But here's the key word, advocate. He's the advocate. The advocate is one who is called to help another. One who pleads the cause of another. As a lawyer may do in court, Jesus Christ made atonement for our sins on the cross of Calvary. He has the right to act as the advocate in the presence of brother and stands and says, oh, you God, he did it again. I can't believe this. Sorry, loser. Look at Terry Boyd there. He's just a loser. And Jesus steps up and says, <clears throat> excuse me. Satisfied. Paid in full. Amen. He speaks up on our behalf. 
and I've confessed them, I've forsaken them, and I keep going. I want to have that fellowship, and because of my advocate, because of the propitiation of the work, the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross, I can have the same fellowship with the same Father and the same Jesus Christ that John had because of what Jesus Christ did. I can have that joy no matter what. Let me give you another bonus. Go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. He says in chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon, bestowed upon us that we should be called, what? The sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Not when we get to heaven, but right now. Just think, when you accept Christ as your Savior, when you come to that point in your life where Jesus says in John chapter 3, he, t he was saying that uh, we must be born again. He told Nicodemus, he says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And he says, you've got to be born again. He says, how do I be born again? Do I go back in my mother's womb and come back out? No. He says, that which is flesh is flesh. He does. So he is the one uh, who seals us. He marks you. You belong to God. You belong to him. So you've got that Holy Spirit until you're in the presence of the Redeemer. And so as a child of God, he loves you. He cares for you. He walks you through life. He grows you. He's given you his Holy Spirit to nurture you, to grow you. Convict you when you do, do wrong, and we will, all right? We will do that, but the Holy Spirit points those out. He says, now are ye the sons of God. Overcome, you've had victory. Because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. How can I have victory over sin? How can I change? How can I separate from the world? Because of the Holy Spirit God gifted me with when I accepted Christ as my Savior. He says, I'm giving him to you to take you through life. He's going to walk with you. He's going to abide with you. He's going to convict you of sin. He's going to show you what's right. He's going to show you what's wrong. He's going to say amen when, uh, uh, when you read something from the Bible. The preacher says something that blesses your heart. The Holy Spirit. I remember as an unsaved person, I didn't have power over sin. It had power over me. But now as a Christian with the Holy Spirit within me, he says, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. That Holy Spirit, I got a hold of that picture a long time ago. When I, 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 I wanted to lead people to Christ, I saw my friends doing it and I thought, boy, I want to be a soul winner. How do I be a soul winner? I got a hold of that verse. Another one where Jesus says, this kind cometh not out by prayer and fasting. And so I got committed every Monday for nine months. I prayed and fasted. I didn't eat anything all that day for, for nine months on Monday. Six months into it, I led my first soul to the Lord. The next three months, it was like dominoes leading one after another to the Lord. Boy, I was excited. I was able to do things. I'd walk up to crowds of people in the wrong side of town. And people were getting ready to put their chest out and ready to fight. And I pull out a track and start witnessing to them. You know why? Because the spirit within me was greater than the spirit that was within them. I had the Holy Spirit of God within me and I wasn't afraid. A little nervous, but I wasn't afraid because I know this verse. So when you've got the Holy Spirit within you, you understand you've got the power of God in you. My friend... That's one of the keys. Another one, look at chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Here's another key. This is how I can sin less and less and have that abundant faith and that life. He says, for what, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Stop for a minute. For whatsoever is born of God. There's a lot of things that say they're born of God. There's a lot of people who call themselves Christian, and they're not Christian. They don't look like Christian. They don't act like Christian. They don't smell like Christian. They're not Christian. There's a difference. All right? They can't overcome sin. They're stuck in it. They, their lives don't change. I'm sorry, but if you're born again, your life will change. You may struggle here and there, but I'll tell you what, you'll keep getting back up. You'll say amen to that which is right. And so he says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Then he says this, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. Notice this, our faith. Our faith. Our faith in Jesus Christ. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. 
There's your faith, believing in Jesus Christ. My faith in Christ has changed my life dramatically. My faith in Christ has caused me, all right, Lord, your word says this. Can I really do that? Can I really tithe and come out ahead? Can I really tell other people about the Lord? Can I really go to Africa as a missionary? Can I really get in front of people and speak publicly without passing out? My faith has helped me to overcome so much. Can I really get all of this sin out of my life and be something that you can use? He says, yes, you can. He's given us all the tools in his word on how we can have that, that joy. And John, John, here's a person, John the Beloved, he loved God. He was known for, as John the Beloved. He was the one that laid his head on the chest of Jesus Christ. They were close friends. And he says, listen, I've seen him. I've heard him. I've walked with him. I've spent time with him. I've listened to the wonderful uh, message on salvation in heaven. I've seen the risen Savior. And I'm telling you, you can have the same fellowship that I have with him. You can have the same joy that I have with him. But let me show you how. Yes, you're going to sin. But confess it. Confess it. You've got to admit it. You've got to admit you're a sinner before you can be saved. Then he tells us not only that, he says, I want you to remember who you are. You're a son of God. And you've got an advocate. You've got a lawyer. Jesus Christ will stand up for you. He'll stand on your behalf. He's your propitiation. He's the one that paid the price in full. You belong to him. You've got to remember that. He's given you his Holy Spirit, and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And every, you have the key within you to overcome any situation, and that's your faith. My friend, what are you struggling with today? Has your life changed since you say you've been saved? Are you, are you, uh, do you have a new desire in your heart to please your Father in heaven? Do you want to grow in him? Is he... he, he Leading you to go in a direction that you're afraid to go in. But his faith will enable you to do it. My friend, we can have that abundant life. We can have that same fellowship. We can have that joy. And it's all right here. Let's pray.